dozens of hours of work per week from a committed team of 37 cast and crew members, all working under one common vision to turn this idea into a film. An idea that spawned from a single news headline and a film that took an entire year to make. Hello there, I'm Himalay Goshi, the director of A Better Man, a film I directed for my VCE media units 3 and 4 sat in 2023, and you're about to follow me on the journey of this project, from mind to page, page to screen, and screen to release. Possibly with a glimpse at what's to come next. Going from mind to page, that is the development stage, began solely because of one person, Andrew Tate, and his arrest in December 2022. A social media influencer known for his misogynistic ideologies, he had entered the limelight once again and so had discussions on matters of gender roles and toxic masculinity. The realization came almost instantly that a film on these themes would have the potential of being incredibly timely and relevant, and given the sheer number of young people influenced by Tate's sexist ideas, I decided to focus my film on brutally depicting the loss that toxic masculinity brings, and how this loss causes damage at multiple societal levels. After thoroughly researching my targeted genre of psychological horror and artists like Jordan Peele, the processes of script writing and assembling a team were kickstarted in conjunction. As the first draft began to take shape, casting calls got sent out and auditions began. The three-week auditioning process resulted in the shortlisting and finalizing of seven key performers for various roles, along with a diverse crew also assembled shortly afterwards for what was going to be a journey of nothing but smooth sailing. Until all footage of our first trial shoot got lost, some key actors had to leave the cast, and the script became overly lengthy and had to be scrapped. After taking inspiration from some recently watched films, I developed a new concept, came up with a new script, and finalized a new shot list in the first week of July. This new concept centered around a paranormal game serving as a metaphor for the loss that toxic masculinity brings. Lighting schematics and set design diagrams were sketched in detail, since I knew that these would play a hugely important role in later stages of the project, and around halfway through July, production began. The transformation from page to screen, and everything in between, is best seen by diving into the script, some behind the scenes footage, CGI diagrams, archival screenshots, and more comparing these to the actual scenes in the film and seeing what remained the same and what changed, and if so, then why it changed. Let's go through the film part by part, starting with all the scenes set in the game. And then I just appeared here. Welcome to the game. Room 1, a cubic chamber filled with cold static air off which the floor and all walls are dark pink, was essentially a huge technical challenge to make since I'd never done such CGI work before. I chose to 3D model each tile, wall, nut and bolt of the rooms separately in the Element 3D plugin inside After Effects. I added rough concrete and metallic textures which served to create a suffocating mood representing the noxious nature of toxic masculinity. Nine computer-generated light sources were then placed in the scene and were set to blue and pink colors, which stereotypically represent femininity and masculinity, and were then animated to erratically shift between these two colors, as if these colors were fighting, to hint at the conflict that toxic masculinity sparks between different genders. Besides the CGI, the cinematography and visual effects were also heavily focused on, especially while depicting emotional dissociation in Room 2. Dissociating is a common anxiety symptom, with anxiety being a common psychological result of toxic masculinity, and dissociating essentially involves disjointing from what's around you in an unsettling way, which was portrayed through VFX by distorting and blurring the protagonist's surroundings. 
Detaching from his surroundings was also conveyed by completely removing his surroundings through the choice of a close-up, and all the sounds of the game, except for his heavy breathing, were faded out for the very same purpose. Just as how a living person has constant sounds of breathing of a heartbeat, the game also had its equivalents in the form of a mechanical droning sound accompanied by this peculiar revving whirring sound, composed brilliantly by David, to bring the game to life. Thus, it felt like its own entity, able to exercise complete control over the player, similar to how the ideology of toxic masculinity does over one's views and values. Instead of doing a stereo mix, in which sound originates from two channels, a left and a right speaker, a 5.1 surround sound mix was utilised, which uses six channels all around the listener and allows me as a sound designer to shift the source of the sound across these channels. Through this, I mixed the sounds of the game such that they sounded as if they were revolving around the listener's head, conveying that the game is everywhere and, just like toxic masculinity, feels utterly inescapable. Sadly, another thing that was inescapable while designing these scenes were the tantrums of Adobe After Effects. Abby Stidzer, one of the leading cast members on the project, initially had several green screen scenes set in the game, but all of these had to unfortunately be removed because every single chroma keying software that we tried failed when it came to applying the green screen effect to her shots. All those files got corrupted. The last minute solution that Caleb and I came up with was to show her voice stuck inside an abstract melted blob, thus conveying the entrapment related to toxic masculinity, and then showing this blob getting progressively deformed, thus hinting at the straining of her relationship with her male best friend, the protagonist. And when it came to his relationship with his mother, that was largely the focus of the scenes in the real world, which were just as fun to film. At this point, I could have opted to cut to the protagonist, but the choice was made to keep him off screen in order to create a sense of increased distance between him and his mother in terms of their relationship. This was part of the loss that toxic masculinity was shown to bring, which was emphasised through another editing choice near the end of the film, the usage of fade to black transitions. Since a fade is typically associated with a gradual shift towards something, and because black can signify loss and nothingness, using such transitions helped in further highlighting the end result of toxic masculinity. This also involved the loss of several personal qualities, opinions and passions that the protagonist initially had, which were essentially not allowed by this ideology, and these were shown through the set design, with his desk being populated with books and posters of movies that this stereotypical toxic male would essentially never approve of. Crumpled paper, being symbolic of vulnerability, was also present, and the very lack of these objects by the end of the narrative represented the character arc that the protagonist had gone through. What his mother had gone through, on the other hand, that is, her backstory, was also made evident through the way she had blocked the entrance to the balcony with duct tape, because this was the place where… Her husband took her own life. These set design choices were further aided by the film's colour palette, which consisted mainly of the two colours that stereotypically represent the two binary genders, except in the film, blue was representative of toxic masculinity rather than simply masculinity. At the beginning, blue was mostly kept in the background, as though to hint at its later emergence into the foreground as toxic masculinity eventually dominated the characters' lives. The one scene in which discordance was used, that is, colours that didn't fit into the normal colour palette, was to convey how the mother felt extremely out of her comfort zone when facing her son's changed behaviour. Just like the colours of the scene, the situation she was facing was also different and beyond her normal. Another thing that was initially beyond normal, for me, 
was working with dozens of actors, simply because I hadn't ever done this before. Realising how talented they all were, however, wasn't just a huge relief offset, but also onset. In a flashback scene showing my character getting physically bullied, the action lines in the script only describe the violence without any explicit context behind it, and Ipe, who played the main bully, improvised and came up with the situation of my character having never kissed a girl before, which became the reason for the bullying and put it into context. As an acting choice, not only is this highly effective because it clearly shows the pressures associated with toxic masculinity, but also because it gave a purpose to their action and thus made it more aggressive. Even though this context was never revealed in the film, the heightened acting intensity still definitely paid off. To add to the scene, the pitch of the sounds the actors were making was also deliberated. As the scene begins, their voices sound suppressed, which is the result of a low-pass audio filter, a tool that only lets the low-pitched sounds pass through, thus making the scene sound muffled and distant, as if the protagonist himself is trying to avoid this memory and distance himself from it. Eventually, however, this low-pass filter transitions into a high-pass one, with the voices getting lesser and lesser muffled, lending them the effect of coming closer and closer. Look at him, look at this guy! Conveying the protagonist's failure to distance himself from a past he cannot avoid. During any one of these flashbacks, even though they were set in the real world, the game was fully in control of the player something that was emphasised through its unpredictable nature. This unpredictability was portrayed through the music, which consisted of the same revving, whirring sound, yes, the breathing of the game, rising and falling erratically in terms of pitch and volume. The tinny and metallic tone colour of it also played a vital role by adding to its unsettling nature. Finally, if it weren't for one key piece of sound editing, the entire narrative may have needed a lot more social context to make sense. The news reporter in the film, played by Amber, has the following line of dialogue. He's been arrested in Romania along with his brother on counts of trafficking and is suspected to have been responsible behind the game Don't Back Yet. Initially, this line was going to appear in the first act, before the main character enters the game, but I then realised that dragging this one audio clip to the very end of the film instead was much more effective, since it draws a connection to Andrew Tate and thus puts everything that happened in the film under the context of toxic masculinity. Which ultimately brings us to the fact that we knew that if we needed this project to be successful in starting conversations about this topic, we needed it to be shared through the world where toxic masculinity is the most contagious. That is, the online world, social media. And it was through these means that the publicity team behind this film brought it from screen to release, while delivering the tease about what sort of film this might be. Publicity was started as early as April 2023, with various promotional media being released at regular intervals on the film's official Instagram account, which eventually gathered more than 300 followers. We utilised something called the two-step flow theory of communication, which essentially says that the influence of a media product on an audience involves certain audience members, called opinion leaders, interpreting the product first and then passing on their interpretation onto other people, which results in an amplification of how widespread the product's influence is. We took advantage of this by holding a limited premiere of the film with an audience of 30 people, who became our opinion leaders, and spread the word to hundreds of more people, resulting in the film eventually gathering more than a thousand views on YouTube. It's been a journey of experimentation, of challenges, of gratitude, teamwork, and of learning. Looking ahead, the aim will be to keep trying different styles, playing around with novel techniques, and working with new people. After all, Filmmaking is for the people, and if the film works, then people are for the film. Thank you so much for watching, and I guess I'll see you next when I see you next. Believe me, I will. Start recording. Zoom in, zoom out. Wait. That's in focus. You 
I know what that yep, is. Yep, exactly. No, I know, but this way. 